Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining our webinar today with Activated Insights. We will give it about 60 seconds for attendees to join, and then we will get started. Thank you. All right, it has been about 60 seconds since the message, so I think that we can go ahead and get started here. Um, all right, well, welcome, everyone, and thank you so much for joining us for today's webinar, Unlock the Secrets to Attracting and Retaining Top Talent, hosted by Hierology and Activated Insights. The goal of today's webinar is to help today's senior care markets, both in-home and facilities, understand today's healthcare worker and strategies to attract and retain them. My name is Alex Knoll. I'm the Director of Healthcare Business Development at Hierology. Hierology is a top-ranked applicant tracking system that works with thousands of healthcare facilities and communities to help them build their best teams. Part of my role at Hierology is to bring together partnerships to market that solve the real day-to-day -day problems we see in long-term care. This is why I'm excited to be partnering with Activated Insights and to be able to introduce Wendy St. Hilaire. Hello, everyone. Thanks for joining us today. My name is Wendy St. Hilaire, and I manage the strategic partnerships here at Activated Insights. You might have seen that we've consolidated our name over the last month and a half, which we're really excited about. You may also know us as one of our additional brands, which are Pinnacle, Pre-Intent, and Home Care Pulse. Um, I'm responsible for working with software partners. Hierology has been a fabulous partner and collaborator in the post-acute care space. We are super excited to be working with this team of experts. Thanks for the opportunity to be here, Alex. Yeah, of course. Can I just make it quick? I think that our screen, I had some weird update happen on my end of things. Uh, Tara, marketing team, can you let me know if I am still sharing? Yep, you're good. Okay, awesome. Thank you very much. Perfect. Let us move forward. All right. So we all know that your time is valuable. So let's go through what you can expect to get out of our time together today. First of all, it's important to understand the job market as it stands today. We'll share some insight um, on what we're seeing relative to the economy, impact on the job market at large, and impact on the healthcare industry as a whole. We'll then talk a bit about what research went into this year's applicant study. We'll uncover and discuss everything today's applicants expect things like designing jobs and tailoring the hiring process to fit their needs. We'll look at how best to build an active candidate database, and we'll wrap today's session with top retention methods and onboarding effectiveness. I believe it's key to success, or I believe the key to success in today's tough hiring market is done by understanding the high level trends we're seeing and adjusting your hiring processes and job offerings accordingly. So let's take a quick look at what we're seeing in the market. Today, we find ourselves navigating two distinct job markets. On one side, we have the tech industry, where many companies are facing layoffs and hiring freezes, a ripple effect from the pandemic and subsequent overhiring. As a result, the pool of active job seekers in tech far exceeds the number of available positions. Now, in stark contrast, industries reliant on essential workers, like healthcare, are experiencing a completely different challenge. There is a significant shortage of employees to meet the high demand. This shortage stems from multiple factors, the pandemic prompting workers to reassess their career paths, decades of declining interest um, in this industry and schools, and the retirement of the baby boomers. The scarcity directly impacts facilities' abilities to provide the volume of care needed. And given this scenario, it's crucial for communities and facilities to innovate their recruitment, hiring, and retention strategies. With the current imbalance between supply and demand, workers in the sector hold more leverage. Therefore, it's essential to understand what they want and how you can address their needs 
regarding job design, the hiring process, and overall employee experience. Yeah, I agree, Alex. The post-acute care industry is currently one of the fastest growing industries in the United States. And a lot of that is those baby boomers. The U.S. population of adults age 65 or older is expected to nearly double from 49 million to 94 million in the next 30 years. Okay, so think about that. That's an additional 45 million people. On top of that, the number of adults age 85 and older is expected to triple from 6.4 million to 19 million in the next 30 years. And just around the corner by 2030, one out of five Americans will be over the age of 65. So definitely something to think about. All of us probably know that today in our communities, but whenever we think about those statistics and then we relate them back to skilled nursing and assisted livings, ugh, assisted living in our communities today, well, what we know is we have a lot more patients coming in. And what we also know is, is that we have a lot of turnover. So when we think about that today, we've got about four out of every 10 employees turning over in the first 100 days of their job. You might think, why is that even important? Um, wh why does that matter, right? It costs on average from a community perspective about four to $5,000 to replace an employee. So it's incredibly costly for those employees that leave within those first 100 days. Typically what we say see is for those staff that don't get past the 100 day marker is they simply haven't serviced enough clients or patients to pay back the recruitment and onboarding cost. So they become a very expensive employee. Another way to think about it is on average, an average community has about 58 caregivers per organization. Again, that's averages. But if we take that number and we average a 40% turnover rate with that 58 caregivers in the first 100 days, what we know is communities are spending about $210,000 on average in turnover cost with just that segment of their employee population. And what we also know is a lot of communities are getting really creative through a combination of onboarding best practices. They're using hiring and HR platforms that are empowering them to make great changes. What I am is I'm super excited to talk to you today, not only about the data, but offer some best practices based on trends that we're seeing across communities in the country today. Back to you, Alex. All right, thanks, Wendy. And this is why we care so much about the hiring process as a whole here at Hireology. It's not just about getting applicants to accept an offer. It's about getting the right team in the door to set your facility or your community up for success. And this is exactly what we set out to do with our annual applicant research. Each year, we're, we survey hundreds of healthcare applicants to understand them more by asking them questions around the following themes. Expectations for the application and the hiring process. What top job seekers are looking for in a new job and what keeps great employees loyal. Today, we're gonna to give you all a sneak peek into that data as we reveal some of those results of this year's study. In the first section, we'll talk about how to design a job that applicants are looking for. As of this summer, so right now, 90% of healthcare applicants are actively looking for work. This means that you have a captive audience looking for their next employment opportunity. Now, the applicant pool might not be as large as we all would like, but that puts all the more emphasis on the need to really understand what today's applicants are looking for. Of those 90% of applicants who are actively looking for work, almost 50% applied to not just one or two jobs, but 16 jobs or more, meaning that from the gate, you're competing with 15 other companies or facilities. We'll discuss how response time and other factors are mission critical in the effort to keep candidates engaged throughout that hiring process, but for now, we're going to talk about how to ensure you're not only one of 16 companies that they apply to, but also one of the companies that they accept an offer from. At its core, recruiting and hiring is all about connecting with the applicant, especially for those in the healthcare profession who are passionate about helping people. The stellar employees at these facilities and communities are there to help the residents that they work with. Therefore, understanding their needs and desires in this demanding work environment is mission critical. It's essential to know what today's healthcare applicants are looking for so that you can create a job that truly resonates with them and attracts those who are dedicated to making a difference. With this in mind, 
Let's explore how to design a job that appeals to today's healthcare worker, helping you build a culture of care while gaining a, com a competitive advantage over your competition. When an applicant goes to apply for a position, salary range is still a critical factor, particularly in the face of our current economic conditions. This should not be a surprise to any of us that pay does drive our search behavior when looking for a new job. I'm predicting this is going to be table stakes moving forward as more and more states require salary postings um, as part of the job posting process. Now, transparency in pay and salary range is critical, but pay isn't the only differentiator giving an applicant, uh, driving an applicant to apply. As you can see here, a good company culture, career growth, schedule flexibility, and fulfilling work all ladder up to the salary range, which means that there are other opportunities for you to highlight to get those applicants in the door. My question to you all is, how can you be transparent about pay while also adding in other factors to make a position attractive to today's applicant? The reason being is we're starting to see a bit of a shift in today's job market. In previous studies, we've seen applicants accept the first offer and then move on quickly. Now, while speed is still the currency of today's applicant economy, there's also more decision-making being put in the hands of today's applicant. Over 60% of applicants entertained at least two offers in their job hunt, meaning when making decisions about the job itself, there are comparison points. I encourage you, you all to do an audit, if you have the ability, to try and understand why your current employees took your job versus others, right? What was the deciding factor in choosing your facility or your community? This will help you as we talk about what to ensure is part of your employee offering and how you advertise that. As we've learned, salary requirements are not end game for today's applicant. There are three other key qualifications that I mentioned earlier that will help today's candidates select you over other organizations. Good culture, schedule flexibility, and career growth opportunity. First, let's talk about company culture. Pre-pandemic, Culture in the workplace studies were all about benefits provided, but what does that mean in a post-pandemic world? After reviewing the results, we're seeing things like this, inclusive, kind, caring, and supportive work environments, enthusiastic leaders who are actively collaborating with team members, and a positive work environment that values and supports employees and encourages innovation and collaboration. What's the through line here? It's that employees want to feel valued. A lot of businesses show this value through compensation, but what we're seeing is that today, especially in the facilities and communities that you serve, that pay is not the only factor. You need to make sure that day in and day out, that culture is felt from the top down. Alex, this is honestly incredibly insightful. Culture is so important. One of the many items I heard you say today is during the hiring process, candidates will have potentially two job opportunities at the same time. And what is really important to them is good culture, schedule flexibility, and career opportunity growth. Um, that may be the tipping scale. Now, it's interesting because in some of our data from 2023, we saw that employee recognition received some of the lowest satisfaction scores for employees. This tells me that a lot of communities can improve immediately in this area. From an Activated Insights perspective, we are the certifier for Great Place to Work in the senior living industry. The certification provides a lot of national recognition and it allows communities to certify obviously as a great place to work. Why does that matter? Well, it kind of matters for a few reasons. Great Place to Work certified companies often see a 20% increase in quality applicants. So that's huge in the middle of a caregiver shortage. That 20% absolutely matters. They see 50% less turnover. And this is a really big one, right? So today we have five generations in our work floors, but when we think about those millennials, we see a 25% higher retention rate with millennial employees that are entering our work floors. The Great Place to Methodology um, is based on 30 years of research and the 60 questions or so are based on something that we call dimensions of trust in the workplace, which includes credibility, respect, fairness, pride, camaraderie, um, and really what we try to do is make it easy for each of those inter generations to engage and provide feedback. 
And for agencies that don't certify for great place to work, just because you go through the process doesn't mean you gain certification. But one of the things I love about that is they're able to remediate and understand areas that they can improve on, which if you think about it is pretty impactful. Um, Alex, I wanna hear more on the trending and what you saw as it pertains to the topic. Absolutely. So how does one show off their company culture uh, to prospective applicants and candidates? Overwhelmingly, the destination um, is the company website or career site. Nearly half of the candidates check an employer's website to ensure that their culture meets their needs. So let's all stop for a second. I'd love for you all to pull out your own community or facility website if you have the option and go to your career section and maybe scroll through that. Does it have pictures of your employees on there? Is, does it have any headlines or, or benefit information or programs offered to represent that company culture? Do you have testimonials maybe from current employees or residents or residents' families demonstrating how amazing it is to work or live or work with your facility? Or does it have job listings? Put yourself in the applicant's shoes. What would make you want to apply? If I was going through the process of finding a destination for a loved one, your company website would absolutely be the first place that I go to to make sure that it is a great place. And the applicant experience is no different. Here's what I described. Here's what I just described kind of coming to life here. We have some pictures. We have testimonials. Um, we have a really good pulse on the company culture of these businesses. And then finally, what's not showed here, because it would have been very, very busy on one slide, is some benefit information highlighting that top, those top benefits. This is the information your applicants want to see when they look at your company career page. In addition to good culture, flexibility has become a core tenant on how people want to work. Too often when I hear about flexibility, I essentially hear they want to work from home or they don't want to work at all. The best way to reframe this concept of flexibility is to think about what can I make work for me? So let me elaborate there. Post-COVID, we're living in a world where there is no longer this concept of, of work-life balance. It's essentially just life. Costs are increasing everywhere, from groceries to childcare and everywhere in between. So when we talk about flexibility, the question employees are really asking is, will my boss or my company or my facility grant me grace when I need it? How does this show up? And what are some examples that we can provide? Well, I'm glad you all asked. Because uh, we heard things like, a compressed work week, right? Can employees have a four day sprint of shifts on and three days off? Or can they uh, have longer shift hours that meet compliance standards, obviously, to take care of their family? Flex time is another one. Can they change their schedule to match a spouse or a family member to help with their childcare? How can they submit this for specific schedules that work best for them? Think uh, summer months when, when school's over versus winter. Do you change their schedules in the off seasons? Um, extra PTO is one. If increasing pay is cost prohibitive, what kind of investment as an employer can you make on your PTO policy? Can your staff earn bonus time? And finally, can you provide pay flexibility for on-demand pay? All those factors are ways that you can show flexibility. You don't have to do it. Uh, you don't have to do all of them and you don't have to do any of them. But as a starting point, talk to your current employees and ask if there are other ways to illustrate flexibility that benefit them. After all, happier employees lead to longer retention, therefore creating a more attractive employee proposition. In addition to culture and flexibility, individuals are interested in looking for a career path. They want the answer to one simple question. If I come to work for you, what could the next 12 to 24 months look like? What kind of paths or routes already exist? Are there examples of success stories? If I don't want a traditional career path, are there other opportunities that I can take advantage of? Or what does it look like um, in terms of mentorship, access to leadership, or job shadow programs? If I want to take the next step in my career, are there additional investment opportunities beyond that? Ask yourself and your teams these questions. If you have programs related to any of it, um, I want you to advertise that, celebrate it, and blast that on your careers page in big, bold letters. And again, if you don't, you can always start small. Look at something internal or an internal team and see who have been promoted there. How did that happen? And is this something that you can scale? Yeah, interesting. You know, lack or, or inadequate training was a top complaint that we saw across the board from both patients and employees, according to our data. 
And, you know, one of the things you talked about, Alex, was clear career paths, you know, as well as advancement opportunities. That's also an area that we saw for top improvement. Compliance training always ranks number one from a priority perspective for communities and providers it was the same last year. But what we know is state regulations vary. However, what we also know is, is that communities that are offering at least eight hours in training and orientation and about 12 hours of ongoing tra our training hours are seeing a complete ROI. And we've taken that data to heart and dedicated a lot of time to making sure that training programs and content is relevant and interesting for communi communities based on their feedback. From a training perspective, this is what we see. We see learning paths offering certificates have really taken off for many communities. We know from clients that are utilizing e-learning tools and our e-learning tools specifically that some of those paths that have the most amount of interest have been in the following areas, diabetic care, behavioral health, infection control, and then I wanted to break out two areas that are really resonating. And some of the, those two areas, one of them is on dementia and Alzheimer's. We talked about a lot of numbers today. So um, this one's important though, about one out of nine Americans are living with Alzheimer's disease today. We added seven micro learning sessions that are dedicated to helping that, that caregiver, along with some industry experts. One of them is Tipa Snow, and really took that extra step with the Alzheimer's Association to be recognized as a specialty program, allowing those caregivers to obtain a really clear career path in that area, as what we know is baby boomers continue to um, continue to come into our communities. The other one from a trending perspective is, is that 50% of caregivers today have had a patient die in the past year. That's really hard to deal with. I mean, it's hard to deal with us from a personal level, but also for a new caregiver and employees, uh, what we did there is we added a six part series dedicated to helping caregivers through um, industry experts like Barbara Carnes, who's a pioneer in end of life care and created a number of books. I would really encourage any communities to talk about what you can offer as it pertains to training as you interview new employees and remind you that if you have existing employees and you're offering career paths, for growth, this may be a really big differentiator that you're missing today. Back to you. Incredible Alex. stuff. Thanks, Wendy. I appreciate your insights there. All right. So we've talked um, about what goes into designing the right job, how you put uh, that into the world for applicants to see, what applicants care about beyond just pay, and then how to showcase that and how to work this internally. Now let's talk about once they've applied, what that process looks like. Before we dive into that, I wanted to highlight an important distinction about today's applicant and where they job search. 63% of applicants use a smartphone or a tablet to apply for jobs. Remember, you're competing with 15 other jobs from the data that we pulled, meaning you have to take advantage of a mobile first experience to capture the majority of today's applicants. Now, before I jump into these next few data points, I'd love to do one more uh, quick exercise for everyone on the call. Take your cell phone out if you have a smartphone. If you have a flip phone, I congratulate you. It sounds amazing, um, but you might not be able to get this done. Uh, but go to your company's website or an Indeed job posting that you currently have live and start the application process as if you were a candidate. Now, as you go through this process, I want you to consider the following questions. Does the application seem like it's taking a long time? Are you having to scroll on your screen multiple times? Do you think it would take more than 30 minutes to complete this application on your mobile phone or honestly on your computer in general? Is the application asking you to repeat information that's already in your resume? And my favorite here is, are you required to create a username and a password in order to proceed? These factors will significantly affect your applicant pool if so, and here's why. 66% of applicants will not apply if the application process is taking too long. In other words, two thirds of the candidates who are already invested in your job description and have already engaged with your career site will abandon the process if it's too lengthy. 55% of applicants won't spend more than 30 minutes on an application. To put this into perspective, let's say that you were buying a pair of shoes online and the checkout process was going to take you 30 minutes to go through. 
Would you be sporting a shiny new pair of shoes from that website right now? We're seeing about half of the applicants will drop if you are asking for repeated resume information. To that extent, I say just grab the resume information after the initial application and have them just submit their name, their number, and their email address because we're seeing a 63% drop off if a username is password. Username and password is required. I want to let that sink in. You're losing about 63% of your applicants if you're requiring them to create a username and password. Remember, you are competing with roughly 15 other jobs and the applicant knows that they are in demand. And adding this step will push them to abandon that application. My recommendation, be one of the applications that requires minimal information, information upfront, but that will allow you to get the application at least in the door. Then you can gather that other information throughout the application process. I know that was a lot. So if you're still with me, I urge you all to take this into account and make sure that you audit your application process across your job boards and your career sites. The goal is to ensure that you're not losing top talent simply because the process is too cumbersome. And if you're unsure where to start, let me clarify. When I talk about making applications easy, it's about creating a streamlined process that doesn't sacrifice speed or the quality of it. We work with thousands of businesses that have successfully implemented fast and simple applications. Consider using pre-screened surveys or make the application process more inviting, by rather, uh, uh, which makes the application process more inviting rather than a barrier. Here's an example of a fast to the point application. It has simple fields, it's mobile friendly, and it keeps the process efficient. Your task is to conduct a quick audit again of your current application processes as a whole. Review how well it's worked for you and identify areas of improvement. Engage with your current partners um, or tech stack, right, to discuss how you can simplify your application, update your career site, and address any other relevant factors. All right, let's talk about speed. First, we all know the phrase, time is money. And in today's hiring landscape, that same staying, saying holds true. Speed is currency. So how quickly do applicants expect to be interviewed? 31% want to be interviewed within one week. However, the more crucial stat is that almost 50% expect to be interviewed in three days or less. This means that the applicants are not just looking for a quick response, but also expect to be interviewed um, within three days. How many of you believe you're meeting this level of speed and intention? If you are, you have a competitive advantage for sure. And if not, or if you're unsure, it's time to audit that process. Determine how many applicants have their first interview scheduled within three days. And if it's less than 50%, you're likely missing out on a significant number of candidates. All right, applicants want to get on your schedule fast, but they also want to hear from you often. <laughs> Think about the last time you applied for a job. You apply and then wait and wondering, am I in the running? Am I moving forward? Do they like my resume? A bunch of other things that are probably going through their head. Given today's communication norms, there's an immediacy in how we interact with our friends, family, and our coworkers. And it should be no different for the applicant communicating with an employer. We're seeing 25% of applicants want to hear from a company they've applied to at least daily, showing them that they are eager to work, which shows them that they're eager to work and want to stay informed of things like where they stand and if there's going to be immediate next steps. And communication doesn't always have to be about scheduling an interview. It can be as simple as you're still in the running. Uh, we're still vetting other candidates. Someone is out of the office this week, right? These touch points are what applicants are looking for today. By keeping them informed with regular updates, even small ones, it shows them that you value their application and are considering them seriously. We talked earlier about how critical mobile has become uh, in the application process, and this pulls through to the candidate journey as well. We're seeing 64% of applicants prefer to be communicated with via text than email. If you still have your phones out, I'd love to see how many emails you have in your personal inbox than you do in your text messages. I can almost guarantee your email will have about 10x the amount of unread messages, and that is being very generous to the email. Candidates want interviews to be scheduled faster, to hear from you often, and to avoid emails not, uh, get buried, that get buried among promotional emails, messages, newsletters, or school updates. This is where texting can come in handy. 
When thinking about your systems and day-to-day -day -day processes, ask yourself, do you have a system that allows you to text candidates? Do you have a way to automate those messages so that you're not having to manually text each applicant? Messages like, thank you, we received your application and we'll follow up shortly to schedule an interview. Or please complete this pre-screen survey to continue your candidacy, which keeps candidates engaged throughout that process. These text messages help candidates feel valued and can give them an, can give you an edge as you compete with other businesses to get their attention, making them more likely to choose to work for you. Okay, so you've done all this work to get people to apply for your positions, to go through the application process, and to communicate with them effectively. And as we know, you unfortunately cannot hire everyone. Or on the flip side, maybe you've done such a great job building your brand that you're looking to build an active candidate uh, database from your current employees, your future employees, and even candidates you passed um, in the past as a way to fuel your rec uh, recruiting mechanism. Let's dive into your, uh, to see what I mean. How many of you thought about reaching out to previous applicants when you're short on candidates? Over 90% of today's applicants are willing to reconsider companies that they've applied to before. So if you're looking for someone who aligns with the career path and culture that you offer and they've already applied, why not go back to those who have already shown interest? You've already invested the time and money into their application. Simply send them a text message to inform them about your new LPN opening. This approach can help you in reduce hiring time, improve the quality of your hires and save you money all in one step. Now, in that same sentiment, most companies do have a referral program from what, for what we're hearing, but if you truly tap into the potential of turning your best employees into your best recruiters, almost 60% of today's applicants strongly agree that they trust a friend's recommendation when choosing where to work, and about 35% somewhat agree to that sentiment. This is a significant influence from friends and family, so why not turn your employees into your best recruiters? Tap into this pool of former applicants and employers and leverage your current team to advocate for you to bring in great coworkers. This typically speeds up the recruitment process, builds your company culture by bringing in like-minded individuals and saves you money on that application. So try this, feature that on your careers page, encourage your employees to post job openings on their social media and create a referral program to reward successful referrals that fit your team and your culture just make sure you have a system to track this. Applicants often apply to multiple jobs. If they know that a position is vouched for by a colleague, friend, or a family member, it's gonna make their decision that much easier. Agreed. Yeah, we're seeing a lot of communities get creative on strategies around retaining and onboarding. So I wanna dive into that. Um, I was at Argenum this spring and really heard some great strategies which communities are using to help retain staff and see great results. So next slide, please. These are some ideas. If you're not implementing these, these might be something to consider. Some communities are actually feeding staff members one meal per shift. Initially, what we heard is leaders mentioned they weren't sure that this would matter. However, across the board, it was noted that this is creating high adoption rates among their employees and caregivers. And the cost oftentimes wasn't massive for many of them. Some mentioned rather than offering a hiring bonus, which sometimes creates a short win, this was more of a win-win. In some cases, this was something in addition to a hiring bonus. In some cases, it was in lieu. As communities, you might want to consider trying something like this for a few months and see if you obtain a higher ROI from a recruitment perspective, but also a retention perspective. Um, it might help on both areas. We also heard some creative ideas on providing housing for staffing. This was a little bit mixed. There was not a clear consensus, but you know it was with limitations. But what we heard is, is if you have open occupancy, it has gone a long way for some communities whenever they, in, in times of need, are able to provide it for a very short period of time for those employees. One of the things that was interesting that Alex just mentioned is, is that over 90% of applicants are willing to reconsider um, you as an employer. This is something that we heard a lot of whenever I was in some of those breakout panels at our genome with some of our best practices and leading communities. One of the things that we heard is, is that for any of those employees that are resigning, you might want to consider sending them a thank you as they leave and a personal note thanking them, reaching out to them over a phone call. 
Um, and then what that does is when they start looking again, the first place they're looking at is your community. And finally, a big one we heard is implementing, you know, some patient and staff measures to obtain and track feedback. I heard this across the board in a number of sessions. This includes everything from aesthetics, like taking that information and changing aesthetics to ongoing patient satisfaction surveys, as well as any type of feedback tools from an employee perspective. One of the tools that we offer actually provides best practices on how to measure not only employee, but also patient satisfaction. From an employee perspective, what we know is employees that are new that are answering any type of that feedback loop or engine, what we know is, is that if they're answering, they're at less of a turnover risk. And those that aren't answering are giving you any type of feedback in that first 90 to 100 days are really flagged, they're at risk. And for in a community to actually know that and put that into a workflow and manage that has been pretty impactful. What we know is, is that 65% of those new employees that are engaging with the technology in those first 100 days are less likely to leave. Does that matter? Absolutely. Because what we know is, is that those employees tend to be the most costly. However, retaining staff is also a big deal. Communities um, can automatically take that survey. They can see who it's being sent to, who's not responding, who is feeling overwhelmed in their onboarding journey, and who needs a little bit of help. We also help communities by tracking retention rates and automatically helping them tweak it, meaning um, you may have really great opportunities and those employees that are ranking you a seven out of 10 or even a six to an eight, you have great opportunities to make some small tweaks and really retain those staffs. And also having a tool that tracks milestones, such as simple things like birthdays, employee anniversaries really matters according to the data. Again, what we know is, is that employees that are engaging with any type of feedback um, surveys are less likely to leave. They, we see an individual turnover drop by 60%, which again is pretty remarkable when we think about it in the middle of a caregiver shortage. From a patient perspective, if you know there's challenges with patients and families and you can see that trending, this is super great. What, why? It helps you come up with a plan, which is oftentimes half the battle. Next slide, Alex. Yeah, this is interesting, right? I mentioned earlier that we're a great place to work certifier for um, employees and communities in the senior living industry. This one is, I, I, I thought to highlight, we have got tons of data that we can highlight and really focus on, but I like this one because a lot of times what we hear is communities are thinking about diverse diversity, equality, and inclusion. So that showed some interesting re results. When employees trust that they and their colleagues will be treated fairly regardless of race, gender, sexual orientation, or age, and this is really important for a lot of generations, but especially for those millennials that are starting to enter our workplace, they are 9.8 times more likely to look forward to going to work. Employees that look forward to going to work are less likely to leave. 6.3 more times likely to have pride in their work, again, less of a flight risk, and 5.4 times more likely to wanna to stay at their company longer. So one of the things that Alex talked a lot about was culture and how important culture is. Some of these, um, some of these measures really make a huge difference. Next slide. You know, Alex talked a lot today about how candidates are looking forward to speed convenience and ease when it comes to that onboarding journey. You know, other creative tactics that some communities are finding really successful include some of the following. Um, before an employee shows up for their very first day of work, communities are having them fill out a quick survey, which just asks them a very you know, simple set of questions about getting to know you, super fun. What's your favorite color? What's your favorite candy? What are your kids' names? Do you have any animals? Which type of animals? What's your favorite movie? Do you have food allergies? Just all of those getting to know you type of questions. And some of those communities are taking the time to, to really take that information and do some simple customized things for those employees. So some examples might be on that very first week of employment, having a few things, of the, a few of those items ready. So as that employee comes in on their very first day of work, having their, their favorite candy at break time sitting there for them. 
or at a milestone, like that first 100 days, sending them a very simple meal that's their favorite food. Um, if they've got animals, incorporating that into maybe that journey of the employment journey, maybe around day 90 or day 60. Another big thing that we saw resonating is sending a welcome letter from your CEO or your leadership. It continues to gain super positive conversation across the board at communities large and small. If you're not doing that today and you hire a caregiver, what we heard today is, is they're not only considering you once they have an, you know, they have an offer, they're considering another community. That extra step is making a difference. Sending them a letter from the CEO doesn't take a ton of time. It arrives, you know, the next day, two days later in their mailbox and really sticks out because others often aren't doing that. Um, lunch. Lunch the first week with a new manager or director. I get it. It takes time. We are busy, super busy in this industry. We don't have a lot of time, I get it. Um, but what we're hearing is consistent feedback that's paying off if you just take an extra hour with that employee to get to know them, focusing on them, take them to lunch, have lunch delivered during training and sit down with them, talk to them. It differentiates you as a community because you are so busy, right? So taking those extra few minutes to just be there is a big deal. And then finally, um, using predictive index management tools. So sending surveys, reading the results of those surveys, right? Anybody can send a survey, but the big deal is taking that data and then applying that to your organizations. Um, you know, and that makes a big difference. What we know is, is that you are retaining staff more through these tools. We believe we have a great tool that does this from both an employee and patient perspective. If you aren't using a tool today to do any type of feedback engine management, I strongly encourage you to consider that today. For anybody want, that wants to learn more about any of the tools that we offer here at Activated Insights, from great place to work, retention tools, recruitment tools, and training tools, please just let us know by replying to the poll question on your screen. We'll have somebody follow up with you and um, follow up with you individually, learn a little bit more about what you're doing from a community perspective, and then talk about what you could do to make some small tweaks. We'll leave this pull up for about 25 seconds. And from a next slide perspective, I feel like we've just blown through today's conversation, but what I wanna do is I wanna summarize um, what we've talked about. Key insights included understanding the applicant. From a healthcare applicant perspective, they seek pay, super important. They also seek transparency. They seek a strong community culture, career growth opportunities, and finally flexibility. All of these things were really insightful. Many of these things from a community perspective you're probably doing today. However, um, some of these things may be new. What they also are seeking is a streamlined application process without the need for a username and password, need for speed is really important and continues to be important in this space. Mobile first communication, this is hard for me, right? I'm not a millennial employee, but what I know and what I continue to see, not only does Hyrology mention this across the board whenever we think about their applicant study, but from an industry perspective, candidates expect communication via text message rather than emails. They appreciate platforms that allow them to text. They also are looking for mobile forward in the application process. If you're not doing that today, some small tweaks in that area make a massive difference. And then what they're also looking for is maintaining contact, staying in touch with that past applicant and current employees, um, as well as you know those past applicants oftentimes are your new hiring pool. They're often interested. They wanna learn more about your organizations. They also are oftentimes willing to refer others. So don't write them off as lost in the process. From a retention and onboarding perspective, hopefully we've provided some really good or uh, actionable steps. Audit your process, evaluate your job descriptions, evaluate your career site, evaluate your website, applicants in the process, eliminate any of those friction points for them. Improve communication, I mentioned it earlier, there's five generations in the workforce today. It's so important to meet them where they are in their hiring journey, as well as their employment journey. Ensure you're communicating with your candidates as well as your current employees in their preferred manner. 
if they're um, not a millennial, but they're an older employee, maybe their, their preferred method might be email. But keep in mind, you've got to be able to support those employees in regards to where they are. And then finally, what I'm hopeful that today provided you is the ability to do something new. We talked about data, but we also talked about some strategies that you can implement today. And even if you implement a small one, hopefully what our goal is, is that it can lead to big successful changes for you. Hey, Alex, can you tell us a little bit more how we can get the report? Of course, it's like I read your mind. Um, if you guys like what you saw here today, our team is pulling all of that information into a report for anyone who's interested to access. Our scheduled release date is going to be August 6th, uh, 6th. So be on the lookout for an email from our marketing team. Um, or if you want, head to hireology.com slash guides on August 6th, and you can download it there. In the meantime, we'll be sending out a recording of today's webinar in case you want to reference any of the data or information that Wendy and I went over. And that's all we have for you today. Um, we left an email address here on this slide if you want to contact our team for questions, um, additional content, or to learn more about the Hireology and Activated Insights Partnership and Integration. Thank you so much for coming. I'm leaving you with about 15 seconds of time.